Well, welcome everyone. Our uh, first presentation of the seminar series this fall. Okay, so we're going to pretend it's a puzzle tonight. So, Catherine March, um, she is at Rich Products and she's been working with us for a while now. So, we are very, very happy that she accepted to come and give a presentation. Uh, since 2017, Catherine has led network optimization projects for Rich Products. And uh, we've done like two or three projects already with, with our students. So she will supply chain models and scenario analysis for short-term tactical operations and long-term strategic projects. So through mathematical modeling, she supports the production design and distribution path of 95 plus million cases of food to your local grocery stores, cafeterias, restaurants, and pretty much any place you eat. So pre, pre, uh, prior to reach, Catherine worked at MIT Bank in back office operations and process re-engineering roles, focusing on process automation and efficiency. She has an undergraduate degree in mathematics from St. Norbert College and a master's of engineering in operation research from Cornell. Uh, Catherine enjoys solving things and playing board games. The more tiny pieces and cascading rules, the better. A youper by a bringing and a transplant Western New Yorker, she spends her free time hiking and cross country skiing with her husband, Matthew, who uh, teaches for us as well. So this is a family affair. Uh, thanks so much for coming, Kathleen. It's wonderful. Thanks, Joaquin. Thanks, everybody, for coming out and signing in tonight. I know it was mandatory, but I appreciate it anyway. Um, so we're going to talk a about a few things tonight. One being supply chains and the puzzles that they are and how we can use math to make them better and how we can use math to make them worse. Um, we're gonna talk about taking it with you, transferring skills from one industry to another and thinking about what problem you're trying to solve, how to ask questions, how to engage with your business, how to engage with people who don't know data as well as you do to solve their problems. Um, so, Joaquin just mentioned that I was a Uber um, by upbringing. Um, if you look at the United States, Ubers are the people from the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, which is that tiny part that sticks out into Lake Superior and Lake Michigan. Um, so not that many people that live, live there. There's more people in Erie County that live there than live in the Upper Peninsula. Um, but I grew up in that um, kind of small, small community um, and went to um, a liberal arts college uh, for my undergrad. So I did a very small kind of collegiate experience and studied math. And one of my, um, I think, junior level math courses was operations research. And up until that point, I only taken like decision analysis and uh, linear algebra and abstract algebra. And I was like, I don't know how I would apply any of this to the real world. And I don't want to be a math professor. So I got to this um, operations research class and we did problems like, how do you arrange the airline schedule so that flights don't intervene or that flights arrive on time? How do you hire a new um, We did all sorts of simulations on how do you get bicycles to the right bicycle share station. Um, and I said, wow, you can actually use math to solve real world problems, that's pretty cool. Um, I want to learn more about that, and so I went to get a degree in operations research. And then I said, okay, great, that's cool. Um, I need a job. So I moved to Buffalo. I've never, never been to Buffalo before I moved here. I um, got a job doing process reengineering, which is basically taking um, less efficient processes and either automating them or reducing the amount of steps, um, trying to make... Um, a process less variable, less prone to failure, um, and run more smoothly. Um, in doing that, I then kind of transitioned to what's called an operations manager role, where there are lots of processes happening behind the scenes to make something happen. Um, these are typically legacy processes, and so what I was brought in to do was not only manage the team, which was in, believe it or not, credit card fraud, but also help them make the processes they were doing more efficient, less paper-based, more automated, um, in some cases offshore. After I did that for a little bit, I said, okay, this is cool. I'm doing like, I'm creating a more efficient world. That's great. Love that. 
Um, but I wasn't doing as much technical things as I wanted to be doing. So I ended up making the shift across companies, across industries, moving from financial services into food manufacturing. So Rich Products is based here in Buffalo, but has a lot of uh, locations throughout the country and around the world. And it's basically a supply chain. It is how do we get food from factories to warehouses to grocery stores to people's homes. And what I do there is, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, is help us decide how we can source product, how we build it, how we move it around, um, and everything in between. And now, um, I've been, so I've been in the modeling game for um, about four years. Recently, my team, which is a, the modeling team, merged with the analytics team. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how modeling and operations research are part of the overarching um, analytics program at Rich Products. So the first topic of today, why are supply chain puzzles and why is everybody talking about them? Um, I, every time I turn on the radio or open... Google, um, I am bombarded with what is going on with supply chains? Why are we not having Christmas this year? What is going on? Why has your um, new comforter not arrived for my Kia yet? Um, and there's a lot of reasons why that's happening. Um, and also, ships shouldn't turn sideways in canals. Um, so, everyone is talking about what does it mean? Why is it important? And why is it all screwed up? Well, a brief and very incomplete history of supply chains and why they are the way they are. So I know this is not a supply chain program, but there's a lot of data involved. This is my own personal Googling and industry history, so it's by far not complete. Um, but in the 40s and 50s, um, we had something called the standardization of parts and processes, where we had things like pallets, where product could be standardized and into a shape. And um, there was a routine way of doing it, and that shape was consistent across uh, companies or across industries. We also had containers, so things like ocean freight. Containers were put on the apps like Lego blocks, so you can stack them on top of each other and arrange them and unpack them. This didn't really um, exist to the same extent before the 40s and 50s. So fast forward a few years, now you have more data that we're collecting and we're now computerizing it, we're recording that data. So it's no longer being uh, in a paper trail, it's now something you can access from multiple places. Um, we also started using operations research, or OR, in inventory optimization. How much do you keep at each, level, at each point in the supply chain? Where do you move your trucks to? How do you get your trucks from A to B to C? And um, in the 70s, Toyota pioneered the uh, Toyota production system, which was called Just-in-Time. This is a way of manufacturing products so that you don't have products sitting in inventory, where it's basically in cash that's sitting there not being used. You're actually just making it just in time for either sale, or you're making the part just in time for when you need it, or you're buying the part just in time for when you're going to manufacture something with it. In the 80s, um, we saw things like mapping, so geospatial mapping being part, being part of optimization models. So now you can not just look at things on kind of a table or on a tableau of something, but you can look at them spatially. We had things like algorithms being used for airline scheduling. So that problem that I talked about in one of my first classes, those started coming into play in the 80s. Um, we also had things like suddenly logistics was very expensive and executives were like, why does this cost us so much? Too much product around. Um, we need to take this out of out of our bottom line because we don't want to pay for this. We want the, you know, to create as much margin as possible. And then the other thing in the 80s was something called Six Sigma was introduced at Motorola and GE. This is a system, if you haven't heard of it, this really focuses on reducing variation. So as you're producing something, how do you standardize it as much as possible to take any variation out of the process so that every time you do something, it happens the exact same way. So that brings us to the 90s. Again, we're collecting more data, we have something called ERP systems which most major corporations use to track every transaction that they have from how they buy product, how they manufacture product, how they get it out the door. So now we're collecting data at every single point. We also had a huge globalization of manufacturing start to happen in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, where you're taking product production steps 
um, that would normally all happen in the same country, and now you're spreading them out across countries. So I think parts from um, all sorts of different countries, and then those parts are going to other countries to become other things. And the other thing that happened was something called lean manufacturing, which, as you saw with just in time, with reduced variation, this was introduced to remove waste. So how can you remove the excess of products that aren't that the customer doesn't ultimately want to pay for, that aren't adding value to your system? So the whole time we're collecting more data, we are trying to use more math to take as much cost out of the system. And in any production, you're also trying to remove as much variation or as much um, things you can't control in the whole process. So that brings us to, to the 2000s. Again, we're still globalizing. Um, we can now, you know, you cannot have stability in a mobilized system because now you're getting um, your sourcing product from all throughout the world. You are down to lowering and lowering your costs because some of those products and where you're producing them, you can pay, you know, different labor rates or different transportation rates to do that. And then in the 2010s, we start seeing the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning to combine the analytics and really go into overdrive in understanding how you're measuring inventory, how you're doing your, your replenishment systems. You're looking at cost versus risk. So what is the cost of doing this versus the risk of it failing, which is what we're doing now. Um, and you have sustainability becoming a more uh, important aspect. So when you're shipping something, it's it's every time you move product around, you're touching it, you're adding, uh, whether it's a carbon footprint or another piece of plastic wrap on it, or you're changing the packaging, um, that all adds up in terms of a carbon footprint perspective. Suddenly in the 2010s, that's something we care about and we have to track. So obviously this is not conclusive, but we think about what's happening today, um, we have spent the last several decades taking as much cost and excess and waste and variability out of supply chains. That means when something breaks or something goes wrong, there isn't excess in any part of the supply chain. So there's not extra inventory in every place because inventory is expensive. Um, removing cost is a good thing because we're trying to control costs of supply chain dollars. But it's a bad thing when variability comes into play because then there's nothing extra. The other thing that's happening, um, particularly in the US, is that consumers are buying a lot more than they used to. And they're buying a lot of goods instead of services because of the pandemic, we can't actually go anywhere and do things, or as many times. Um, and so we're staying home, we're at things for our home, we're fixing up our home offices, we are investing in goods instead of services. Um, as an example, um, rich products, so expected to sell, I want to say, somewhere between like 90 and 95 million pounds of, uh, pieces of product this year. Um, I've already sold like 105, and so we're already overselling, and we cannot make the product fast enough. Um, so we cannot supply it to all the places that would like to buy it, because we cannot make it fast enough for people to go home and celebrate with ice cream cakes at home. Um, so it's not all supply chain planning's fault, it's not all optimization fault, it's a combination of systems that were designed to run much more efficiently or much more cost reduced that were um, faced then with huge amounts of risk all across every point of the supply chain. They weren't ever expecting to have that much risk occur across every point of the supply chain. So. This is a brief example of the richest supply chain um, told by how we make products. So we're a food manufacturing company. Um, we make anywhere from anything from pizza crust to ice cream cakes, mozzarella cheese sticks to Taco Bell just launched something called a chicken taco sandwich thing. We made the taco sandwich thing part of that. Um, so we make all sorts of food things that go into other um, Things that you might eat, whether that's at a cafeteria, or it's at a restaurant, or it's in your grocery store. Um, you probably had some of our food at some point. Um, you just may not have, have realized it. So when we are thinking about our supply chain, start with suppliers. Um, well, let's start with the farmer. The farmer, really. And the farmer, let's say, is a, a wheat, because that appears to become a wheatish little icon. Uh, 
Um, and then the farmer would have to have a crop in whatever year, um, which of course is controlled by commodity pricing. Um, and then there's a storage cost for that and a processing cost for that wheat to go from wheat to grain. And then you have to store it. Um, and you have to QA test it and you have to um, keep it secure. Um, and then you have to buy it. And then you have to move it from wherever it's being stored to wherever it's going to be processed into flour or something. And so then there's another company involved that's, that's going to process it and they have employees and they have storage costs and they have equipment costs going in to process the flour. Um, after that, it moves again. So there's another truck driver involved or another engineer involved to drive the product around. Then it goes to a warehouse and somebody has to unload it from the truck and put it into the warehouse. And then it has to be saved and stored and paid for at that warehouse. So it's taking up space. From that warehouse, it's on another truck. So now we've got another truck driver who's going to this time rich products facility, who's unloading that flour. Those facilities have employees that are then running a production line. Those production lines have equipment parts, which are sourced from somewhere else. Um, and there's lots of other raw materials that are coming in to that facility that are making um, what's called a value-added uh, food product. From there, we probably went on another truck, but maybe we just went right to a warehouse. I don't know. Um, so there's another storage cost. Um, and there's another person who's got to unload a pallet and put it into um, a, a warehouse. Then you got another truck because now we got to get it to the customer. Um, and the customer is actually probably a grocery store. So then the grocery store has to have someone to unload it and someone to put it on the shelf and someone to restock it. Someone to check you out um, at, the, at the cashier. And then you ultimately are going to purchase that loaf of bread or that pizza crust. So this is actually a more abbreviated version than what actually happens. Um, but you can see there's a lot of parts that are happening in cascading. So any single part um, has the opportunity for failure. The more steps you have, the more opportunities you have for something to break down. So these are all puzzle pieces. Um, problems in today's supply chain, um, material scarcity is something that we face a lot and I think a lot of companies are facing a lot, whether that's raw material, for example, um, we ran out of this form of sugar that was used, we realized in like 40% of our bread products and nobody could make this um, throughout the world. And we were suddenly like, wait a minute, we bought it on purpose because we could use it in so many different ways, but now we don't have any access to it and we cannot make all of these different things. Maybe that's not a good thing. It's a good thing to buy and have the value of scale of buying the same thing. But suddenly when you can't get it anywhere, it's no longer a good thing. Cord or um, cardboard boxes. Huge demand for cardboard boxes um, today, and also a huge shortage for that. Right now, we don't have enough cardboard boxes to make um, our cake products. So we have everything to make a cake, no boxes to put them in, we cannot make the cakes. Um, plastics, equipment, parts, anything that goes into that production line um, has to be modified or, or checked by engineers. Any part that's not available, now you don't have a working production. The other thing that we're facing and every industry is facing um, is labor scarcity. So at every single point where I mentioned someone's driving a truck or someone's run operating a forklift or someone is working on a production line or on a farm, um, there um, are labor scarcity, um, whether that's challenges because of COVID and, and shutdowns related to COVID, challenges because of labor um, uh, employment rates or employment wages, um, or just challenges because demand is crazy high and everybody's trying to hire because demand is crazy high. Um, so a lot of scarcity at every single point, which makes every um, puzzle piece not fit together as closely as they used to fit together. Um, the other kind of piece is the supply chain design. So this is the piece that I'm most involved in. Um, so this is the fact that we have optimized all of these networks, optimized all of these parts in the puzzle so that they fit together and that there's not, nothing extra and nothing left over. Because duplicity is expensive. Having something that is duplicated in multiple places is expensive. Um, and it's cheaper um, and less operating costs to have 
everything just go smoothly and just in time and um, with no kind of variation for what's supposed to happen. The other challenge is demand forecasting. So as you may have guessed from if you are doing forecasting um, in your, some of your courses, um, nobody can do demand forecasting anymore because COVID-19 shattered what we were doing and consumer behavior is totally different now. Um, and so there's a lot of companies and at every single point in those um, supply chain, there's a different demand forecaster. So there's a different person who's saying, here's how much I should plant at the farm because this is how much I'm gonna sell. There's somebody at the, um, uh, at the train company who's saying, here's how many um, schedules of this particular train route we need because this is what we're expecting. There's um, folks at every warehouse saying, we're planning to store this much, so we only need this many people to unpack it. And as those forecasts slowly like kind of fell apart, um, a lot of those companies are now using gut instinct or tribal knowledge to make that happen. And that's it has pros and cons. Um, the other thing that's happening is the consumer preference changes. So not only are people buying more, they're buying differently. So um, there's a shift in expectation. Consumers are expecting things immediately. Even food that they're buying from a company like Rich Products, if you're not you're not buying as a consumer, but the buyer, who's a buyer from Walmart or Target or or Wegmans, uh, they're expecting the same kind of turnaround time that they're getting personally at Amazon. And that's not the way our systems were designed. Um, E-commerce is at an all-time high. Um, so we are seeing even more direct-to-consumer shipments. So like the kidding that you might see with like a HelloFresh or a Blue Apron, that's at an all-time high and continuing to grow. And consumers are just buying more things to enjoy at home and more things to um, do at home rather than services. So all in all, it's a pretty exciting puzzle. Um, so how do we do that? How do we take all those pieces and make a model out of them? Um, so what we're doing is our supply chain and many supply chains exist as a result of individual decisions. So these decisions happen every year where we're saying we're going to acquire this company or we're going to build this plant and we're going to build it over here because this year and for the next five years, we're expecting demand to be like this. Um, we're expecting it to grow this amount. Um, and so this is the best place for us to have a plan. Decision done, build the plan, go. Next year, next day even, that um, optimization decision may or may not be still the minimum cost or the maximum profit. So what we see in um, a network modeling program is that we are constantly trying to re-optimize and say, hey, the network has changed. The customers have changed. Our acquisition strategy has changed. Now we need to, um, here's the new normal, here's the new normal. So what we do is we try to create a model, um, a computer model, that reflects what we do in our supply chain. So we have our sites in there that are manufacturing things, we've got our products, our work centers or our production lines, we've got our distribution centers. We're trying to mirror what's going on in our network. And once we can mirror that, we can jam a bunch of scenarios into it and say, what happens when all these weird things happen? So we will run um, lots of changes saying, hey, if we shut down this plant, or if we open this over here, or if this customer goes away, or if we get this new customer, um, what happens to our costs? What, can we even fulfill this demand? Um, what happens if we can't fulfill demand? Or what happens if we have too much uh, production capacity? Um, so we will create that, we call it a digital twin. Um, twin might be kind of more fraternal twin than identical twin. Um, but it is a twin of the real world, or it's kind of a mirror of the real world, um, to be able to run some of those scenarios and do some of that um, testing. But at the end of the day, like it sounds fancy, but it's really just operations research map. Um, I'm going to watch all those. So some of the things that I learned in either math or my graduate work, um, I still use like the general topics of today. I will say I'm not creating formulas every single day, but I do have to know how those formulas work in order to be able to create these models. So um, linear programming or mid-centered or linear programming, something we use, um, that's what our optimization models are doing. Um, they're trying to find the minimum cost or maximum profit of a set of, of an objective function subject to a set of constraints. 
Um, we also do inventory modeling in some cases. So we might do a BBC analysis where we'll look at um, our A codes or B codes and our C codes. We have different inventory replenishment policies for those different types of codes. And then simulation. So this is when we'll create a model um, and we'll actually say, here's how the system works. What happens if you have a 60% chance of this event occurring and then a 20% chance of this other event occurring at the end of a period of time, what's your um, average um, run rate or what is your average amount of defects that occur in this system? So all things I studied or had to do um, work on in school and then actually really got to translate into the real world. So yay school for that. And so you would want to minimize the total supply chain, but subject to all of these different departmental or functional level constraints. Um, the other thing you have is there's lots of levers to pull. So you might say, I'm going to increase the amount of throughput at my plant, but decrease something else um, in order to get to a minimum cost. Um, and you might do it, do it the opposite way. Um, Setting up, so this is uh, an example of something we do often is think about our warehouse network and how many warehouses we should have to store product, where they should be, how much, how big they should be, how much inventory they should hold to handle variability in demand. Um, and oftentimes, adding more warehouses means that you're going to spread that inventory across more locations. So you probably have to keep more of it. Um, but you might be closer to the customer. And so your transportation routes might be shorter. So you might need a trucker or a driver to be on the clock for less amount of time because they're not going as far. But um, over the, um, the comment I have about capital, if you're building that warehouse, you're gonna have to spend a lot of money up front in order to build that warehouse and then pay for it over time. So there's a lot of different ways you can get to that minimum cost by saying, I'm gonna introduce more warehouses or I'm going to keep my existing warehouses and save on the capital. Um, and being part of supply chain modeling, what we do with our models is model these type of scenarios and say, if we do this set of options, here's our minimum cost. If we do this set of options, here's our minimum cost. And so on and so forth. Oh, and a well, fun fact, everything's variable in the long run. So what that means is, Today, you might have a fixed location, and you might say, we definitely have to use this plant. We have sunken costs here. It's a huge facility, manufactures a ton of products. But when you go out 10, 20, 30 years, suddenly that's not a fixed asset anymore. Suddenly it's, hey, in 30 years, we don't know if we'll want this plant there anymore. We don't know if we'll even be making this type of product anymore. So there's a lot of modeling in the industry, I know particularly for oil, where they will look out um, into refinery futures for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And we'll say, what are we looking at in terms of production for the next long amounts of long term amount of data? And everything becomes more and more variable the farther you go out. Um, so, as we make all of these models, um, we have found that um, executives and leaders are very interested in constantly asking, what's the best thing to do now? Okay, we've made a change, what's the best thing now? We've made a change, what's the best thing now? Um, so what we've done at Riches is develop a couple of what we call core models that are repeatable, and we update them every month or every um, quarter or every week. And we re-optimize. We say, okay, here's the new normal, here's the new network, um, and here's what the lowest cost or what the optimized solution is within the new normal. So we have what we call our network optimization models. These are network design related models. So we look at those when we're doing um, where to make product, how much to make of it, how to ship it from what DC to what other DC. I apologize, DC is distribution center, if I didn't say that earlier. Um, and we might also look at consolidation. What if we put these two production sites together? What if we expanded and we added more production sites? Um, we do something called center of gravity or Greenfield, where we're saying we're going to build something new. 
where we want to build it. Where's the center of gravity for the demand? And we have, the reason we have three of them is because they're all aggregated to different levels. So some of them are SKU or stop keeping unit product level specific, where they're very detailed, have a lot of data in there, thousands and thousands of combinations or rows of data. And if you think about a matrix, the more variables you have, the longer it takes to solve. So we have some models that take an hour or two hours to solve one scenario. So great, because it gives you a detailed answer, not great if you're trying to run 50 scenarios. So we also have some models that are aggregated at a higher level where they're in product families or they're in customer groupings. And so they have fewer variables, fewer rows of data, and they can solve in three, four, five minutes. You can run 30 scenarios and get you know, a lot of different options um, and get a pretty good estimation or a directional estimate of, of what the minimum task is going to be. Um, the other model that we have is our transportation routing model. This is a very detailed model in terms of how do you stop at multiple places and do something at each place. So sometimes it's called a traveling salesman problem, um, where you have product on a vehicle and you can stop at a number of different locations and drop off in a certain combination. Um, and the number of locations you stop at is variable, and what is on the truck or what is on the, the transportation unit is variable. So we have done we have built a model like this that helps in our kind of more tactical modeling of how should our trucks be routed to customers to deliver products so that they travel the least amount of distance. Um, and a lot of these models are repeatable so that we can uh, refresh them and answer um, our our leaders and our executives questions about what we're doing, about what is optimized, about what the new normal is. And modeling is really a part of a larger supply chain analytics program. So you may have seen this before. Um, I didn't create this, but I will take credit for putting it on the slide. Um, modeling is part of supply chain analytics as a whole. Analytics is a very, very broad spectrum. Um, it can be what's going on, what's happening. It can be what's going to happen, help me forecast. And it can be what do I do if that happens? So network modeling tends to fall in the prescriptive area where it's what to do if something happens. Um, and a lot of your analytics, think of your forecasting, that's what's likely to happen. That's going to be more on the predictive side. So modeling is really part of this whole kind of chain of analytics for supply chain. Um, I'll look at some of the other analytics that Richards is doing in supply chain. So this is more on the what's going on and what will happen. So think of what's going on in our warehouses, what's going on with our customers, why are we cutting the product, what's our inventory going to be, um, when is when is service going to fail, um, order management. We are doing all sorts of exciting things just to understand what is going on at our warehouses or at our plants, and then what to do about it. Um, modeling is, is just a piece of that. So we talked a long time about supply chain. I'm sure you're all very excited to go and join the industry. Um, well done. So the next kind of section is much shorter, fair not. Um, it's really what problem are you trying to solve? So thinking about what, what questions are you trying to answer when you're working in a business or when you're working um, on an analytics project for a company. Um, and the key thing I've got here is know what the business wants before you try to do anything. Um, it is very important to know like, what's important to your stakeholder, what do they care about, what's their ultimate goal um, before you actually build anything. So that's what we call scoping. What is the problem behind the problem? What are, why are we even here? Why is this, um, in this case of supply chain, um, why are we talking about a pizza plant? Is it because we're out of capacity? Is it because we have too much capacity? Um, is it because we're growing a certain area or because we're trying to close something down? Then you need to understand your data. I cannot stress this enough. When the data is new to you, you need to spend a lot of time just figuring out what is the data trying to tell you and what is it not telling you? Um, and then looking at your constraints, they talked a lot about constraints in the network or constraints at plants. Um, asking what 
what's fixed? Like, what can I not play with? And what's variable? What can we train, turn on and off? What can we add to a scenario? Once you try to get an idea of the data, you probably need to rescale because you may not have the exact data that you were hoping for, or um, a stakeholder uh, may realize they want to do something different now that they fully understand what's going on in the data. So it's always important to keep asking, what are we doing? Are we still on the same page? Why are, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, in any modeling or analysis, what I usually do is build a baseline. So building a network model is trying to duplicate what's going on in the real world. Can't do that if everyone just thinks you work in a computer and it's not the real world. So what we do is we have to create trust that the model that we built actually represents what's happening in the environment. So we do a lot of um, building trust of, hey, here's the data, here's what we did to it, here's how it reflects what's going on in the real world, and here's the metrics that, that show that it does reflect that. And then you get to do the fun part, which is creating scenarios. And the reason I say that's the fun part is because that's where you get to the creativity piece of this, where you're talking about, well, is this really variable? What if we took off this? Or what if we explored this? Or what if we did this other thing? You get to really um, not just think about the current data you have, but like a potential um, change or potential future. So I think it's, um, it gets a lot more exciting. And then kind of the last thing is uh, communicating the assumptions, communicating what the model results say and what they don't say. Um, a lot of times um, when you're creating a program or an analysis or you're writing code, the your one of your goals is to get the code to work and be correct. Um, and another goal is to make sure it's answering the question that you think it's answering. So making sure that you're communicating to your stakeholders, hey, here's what this says, but also here's it doesn't say these other things. It says this thing, because that's what we modeled, or that's the question we need to, we're trying to answer, but it doesn't answer these 50 other questions that you have, just to be clear. Get caught in that quite a lot. Um, what else? Validating your data. So somebody, um, I can't take product for always be question, asking questions about your data. Um, this is something that um, somebody uh, that I've worked with a lot says all the time is make sure you are asking questions about what's going on in your data. Use simple statistics to understand what's happening in that data. I'm talking, hey, what's the average of this? What's the maximum field of this? Honestly, you'd be surprised at how often people are like, oh, really? That's in there? Oh, I didn't realize that was the whole thing that we were looking at. Um, and then talking to the stakeholders to make sure they understand the data you have and how you're interpreting it is the right way to interpret it. Because it, as with anything, if you put garbage into it and you don't understand the data that you're putting into it, you're going to get an answer because you're smart and you built the model to work. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right day, the right answer. So if you have bad data or a state you don't understand, you're not exactly sure what the fields mean or, or what their ranges are, you're just going to create something that isn't really helpful and may lead someone to a, a bad decision. Um, getting an answer and getting the right answer are not the same thing. I say this to my team all the time. You can make it solve and it'll be, it'll be feasible. It'll be an answer. But is it the right answer? Is it the answer that you think it is? Because um, as with anything, a computer or a model is really just a calculator. It's trying to give you a good answer. It's trying to give you an answer that works. Um, you are the human. You are the one that gets to interact and understand, is this the answer that I was looking for? Um, again, there's often more than one right way to do something. Um, Profit maximizing might not be the same thing as um, service if you are servicing demand with low margin. So something we talk about is, yes, we could minimize costs or we can maximize the profit. If we maximize profit, we might decide we don't want to service all of our demand because it's actually negating the amount of profit that we could get. Um, and those are those two things. Are we maximizing profit or minimizing costs? They're not actually the same answer. And depending on the business or the company that you're working for, you might be looking for one or the other. The other thing um, in, the, in the whole supply chain I was talking about is 
it's very hard to be lowest cost and also most agile. So if you are very agile and you're ready to adapt and you have a lot of inventory and a lot of flexibility to be able to shift your production, um, that's great. You're very agile. You can respond to changes in customer demand, your fluctuations in market conditions, but you're probably not going to be the lowest cost producer of something. And you have to, as an analyst, you have to develop what's more important and what's the trade-off of being more agile versus being lower cost. Um, and lastly, short-term success doesn't always mean long-term success. So um, as we have seen with the pandemic, um, there were a lot of industries or a lot of companies that had a lot of challenges up front um, maintaining their business model um, in the short term um, because they may not have had the right cash flow or they were maybe very reliant on incoming or, or to be paid um, invoices. Um, remember that a short term decision that is beneficial or minimum cost right now may not be the same in 5, 10, or 50 years. And it may not lead to longevity in the future. So as an analyst or as a modeler, something you have to think about is, is this the right solution for now? Is it the right solution for five years from now? What's the time period where this goes from being the right solution to being the wrong solution? And taking it with you. So I said at the beginning that I used to work in banking and then I moved to supply chain and those are very different industries. How did I do that? Um, the thing that things I learned when looking at banking data, um, cost is bad. Um, cost um, is something you want to reduce um, when you are in a back office banking role. You're also trying to mitigate risk as much as possible. Um, you're also trying to comply with regulatory components. Um, so I did a lot of um, assisting on projects where we would try to take any risk or any cost out of a system. So think that affects that lean manufacturing or Six Sigma. We're trying to take out variability, take out cost components, um, but and, and mainly understanding what the business did and what the customers were. It's not, it wasn't just about the data. And then things I learned and started using when I moved to supply chain were the exact same things, where cost, not as great of a thing, how can we take that out of the system? Um, um, how can we reduce um, error or reduce um, increase efficiency? How do we take risk as a component of cost? Um, something we think about a lot lately is, do we have to increase our costs to decrease our risk exposure? Um, instead of industry com or regulatory compliance, we have industry compliance and food manufacturing. We can't necessarily make uh, marinated uh, pulled pork at the same place that you make donuts in, for maybe obvious reasons, was not obvious to me. Um, and understanding you know, the business and the customer. It's not just data, it's not just product codes, it's not just run rates, it's um, how the business works, the people that are working in the plants, the people that are working on the, in the warehouses, and the people that are, you know, the customers that you're trying to support, um, and, and how the supply chain is really connecting the whole, the whole thing of it. Um, the other thing about taking it with you is the tools will constantly change. Um, I've only been doing this uh, seven or eight years, and I've already learned dozens of tools. Um, I Even in supply chain modeling, I started with one tool, went to another tool, went to another tool. The tools are constantly evolving. So at any given point, you're probably going to have to be learning a new tool, a new programming language, a new something. Um, and to be prepared to continue using the skills you're learning right now and learning new things, to continue learning new things. It's not all technical. The technical stuff is great. But make sure you understand how your company makes money, how they are making decisions, what's important to those leaders, and being able to translate um, the data to what the business needs to do and how the data makes the, um, makes the company strategy work. 
So as a data analyst or as a, a data specialist or a modeler or whatever you end up calling yourself or calling yourself today, um, translating um, the data that you work on, the, the model that you build to why it's important to an executive or why somebody needs to care about it, that will always be a usable skill and is a very easy skill you know, in today's environment. And lastly, always ask how you can help. Um, this is something that has helped me a lot in my career is just saying, yeah, that's the crappy project. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, this is the thing that nobody else wants to do, but it needs to get done. I will help with this project. Um, I, will work on, I will work on this. Um, that will take you really, really far. So lastly, um, I'm almost on time, so I'm really happy with myself. Um, one final thing, I would be remiss if I did not talk about my employer and a little bit about them. We are a multinational corporation with 12,000 employees based here in Buffalo, New York, believe it or not. Um, many of our employees do not work in Buffalo. Many of them are at uh, some of our 26 U.S. or Canada manufacturing sites or 16 mobile sites. Um, we make 100 million cases in each year in the U.S. and Canada, like 25 or 30 million globally. Um, anywhere from pizza crust to birthday cakes to the Taco Bell Chalupa. I keep talking about them. You can obviously think that's what we'll be stopping after this. Um, we are very into innovation. Originally, we were started as basically a startup company. Um, by Robert Rich the, the first, um, who said, I need a way to sell, um, he's a dairy, dairy farmer, and he said, customers are asking me for whipped cream, and I can't sell whipped cream, this is 1945, and we're on matches. Um, but I can sell non-dairy whipped topping made from the, whipped topping made from the soybean, and started the company from there. So, always innovating, always trying to come up with new products or new ways of doing things. We are also have a lot of data-driven jobs. Um, I particularly work in the supply chain area in analytics and optimization. Um, we have a lot of data-driven jobs in demand creation, which is basically just marketing. Um, we have a, tech, a technology data lab that just uh, hired like three data scientists into. We have sales analytics, and we're starting up a master data management team um, here in Buffalo. So it's a great place to work. I would not be here talking to you if I didn't work there. Um, so consider us when you're thinking about internships or thinking about future employment. With that, thank you.